Hey there, everyone. Um, the, uh, you are now here to see me talk about uh, Dr. Etcd or how I learned to stop worrying and love the data store. Um, as you can tell, it's a Dr. Strangelove reference. Uh, and uh, importantly, uh, Dr. Etcd is not me. Uh, just like in the movie, that character is barely in this talk. That is literally it. The joke is, the joke is over, the joke is done. Please don't, I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to claim that mantle for myself. Okay, okay, so, but what am I, what am I gonna talk about? Well, I kind of anticipated that you're probably here for this. Uh, lots of ETD war stories. Um, you're actually gonna get some ETD war stories, uh, but uh, uh, there'll be a couple of, uh, I wanna kind of give you some tips about uh, upgrades and um, how managing database size and speed is super important when you're managing uh, ETDs. So, Let's, let's go over the basics just in case anyone's wandered into the wrong session. So etcd is a distributed, reliable key value store for the most critical data of a distributed system. That's straight from the website, you know. Um, but the important parts for this talk, and pretty much every one of these later points is gonna be important later, uh, is uses RAS for consensus, which means that there's an uh, elected leader that's the, that holds the leader lock. Uh, it is based on Bbolt, which stores the whole database in memory with occasional flushes to disk. Uh, and it stores, it, it actually acts like a, a git log a little bit. It stores all transactions on all keys unless you tell it otherwise. Uh, you know, spoiler for later, Kubernetes does tell it otherwise, so that's why you've never noticed this. Um, you are probably using it for Kubernetes. And lastly and most importantly, if you have a problem with your etcd cluster, you have a problem with your queue cluster and you are have, probably having a bad day. Uh, maybe you don't know it yet though. So, when, uh, yeah, when I, when I and the team I was working with first started uh, using etcd, um, there was one thing that we were most worried about. Upgrades. Upgrades going wrong. Um, and so we spent a lot of time and effort thinking about, you know, how do etcd upgrades work? How does the, you know, what are the failure modes for etcd upgrades? How can you make this whole thing easier to manage and easier to actually administer? So. We set some ground rules at the time. Firstly, we wanted to have separate etcd nodes from the, control, from the rest of the control plane because we were really worried about blast radius uh, and you know, if something goes wrong with one of them, we didn't want it to affect the other one. etcd is your store of truth. It's your truth repository for, for your Kubernetes cluster. And so you really want to make sure that, you know, that something going wrong on your API servers and control plane doesn't mess with your thing. I think this is a slightly old-fashioned rule now. Most people seem to be completely cool with running their stuff on the, on the same control plane. Uh, yeah, I mean, personally, I'd still be a little bit iffy about it, but it's definitely a much lesser thing than it, than it used to be. Um, we wanted to make the nodes immutable as much as we could. Uh, everyone in the team that I was in at the time uh, is, was you know, old school sysadmins. We had done a lot of sysadmin stuff. Uh, we had found that imp immutable infrastructure saves you from so many problems that we really wanted to try to do that as much as we could. Also, we were running in AWS, and so we wanted to try and use whatever AWS primitives we could to make, the, uh, you know, to make things easier, to make AWS work for us. So, we tried a few things. We started out with um, static named nodes that were all managed uh, in Terraform, uh, and so you, know, you provision the nodes in Terraform, you provision the volume associated with the nodes in Terraform, you know, pretty naive implementation, kind of worked, uh, as long as you didn't need to do an upgrade. Um, we found a few sharp edges pretty quickly with the upgrades that I'll go into a bit later, but so we tried another thing which was trying to make it so that the etcd nodes were in an ASG that would, be aut that would auto rotate whenever you change the config. Uh, if any of you are thinking about doing this, don't. It's a horrifyingly bad idea. Um, the way the consensus works, it's really difficult to ident you need to be able to tell etcd when it starts up how many nodes are in the cluster, which it is impossible to do when you're a part of an ASG without sort of having a real self-referential bad time. Uh, and again, we tried, we tried a few things and ended up with trying to do some stuff with immutable instances. But the problem there is that if the instances are immutable, how do you make sure that you keep the data so that you don't lose all the data in the event that all the instances go away suddenly? Um, spoiler, we did find something good, but later. Um, here we are, and here's later. Um, uh, the first thing was we, used, we ended up using an immutable OS partition. So uh, etcd machines are core OS machines with, a, with this immutable OS partition. By immutable, we don't mean nothing ever changes on it. We mean we don't care what's on it. But that's because 
we have a separate data partition which is mounted by a small program at boot. So you know, in AWS, normally you provision an EC2 instance, blah, 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 it's all good. Um, you provision a volume as well, that gets auto-attached and whatever both uh, uh, EC2 and or whatever tool you're using, manage that, like make the life cycle concurrent. Uh, and so the, but what we did is just make it so that that was not the case. There is a volume that's assigned to this, to each ATD instance, and, is, and at boot, there's a little Go service that runs that picks the ATD instance that it's been told to and attaches it to the, to the uh, instance. And that, what that does is that when, you, when you're doing Terraform, sorry, ah, I'm trying to use it, uh, hang on. This one. Um, why, while you're trying to, um, you, when you're mounting this petition, you can make sure that, um, that the petition's lifecycle is 100% separated. So there's no way that that data can get deleted when you terminate the instance. Uh, again, that's a, that will be important later thing. But, and the last thing that was important was that we put lifecycle protections on all the stuff for the etcd. So even if you, if someone changed, the, changed something about the etcd, Terraform will never, ever go and actually delete that, uh, delete that instance with a, a person has to actually do the deletion. It's a bit sucky, it, but, and it meant that there is a, a manual process, but on the balance of it, we ended up deciding that having a manual process for the place that stores the, the source of truth for your cluster was probably okay. Um, again, that was because our numbers were less than 100, so it's doable. If you're running thousands of clusters, then I feel for you, uh, but, and also, you know, you probably should not be running, managing etcds unless you work for AWS, hi Gus. Um, so, uh, what I do differently? Don't manage etcd yourself. Use a managed service that does it for you. Make it someone else's problem. Um, if you are managing your own etcd, you want to upgrade to 3.4 as soon as it's stable. Um, there's a new uh, node state called learner that basically means when you're upgrading, instead of joining the cluster and being part of the consensus before it has populated all of the, the data from the rest of the cluster, it, can, it learns first before it becomes part of the election. So it's impossible for the, a learn, node that's in learner mode to cause like a, a, a split brain via a loss of quorum. So th this is really good, it makes, the, uh, it makes the upgrades heaps safer. It's introduced right now, uh, 3.4 is in beta now I think, um, it's only just introduced, it's not by default. In 3.5 it will be the default though when they eventually come out, get out around to releasing that. Um, also I would spend some more time investigating the D using DNS discovery for dynamic node provisioning to see if we could do, to see if I could actually make something work for ASG. Um, I make no guarantees about that though. Um, so. Here's the real meat of why you're here. All the stories about all the times it didn't go well. So, the first, the main, there's sort of two main classes of problems that we had. The first one was leader election storms. Now, leader election storms are when you, there's just continuous leader elections and so nothing can actually happen in the cluster because there must be a leader elected for the cluster to be able to write. Uh, the, the second thing that happened was that we filled the database. ATD's database by default is 2.1 gigabytes. If you put 2.1 gigabytes worth of data in it, you will have a bad day. Um, we did that by breaking the compaction, which is what keeps the database small, and sometimes by just putting too much stuff in there. So firstly, let's talk about leader election storms. Um, so basically it's continual raft elections mean that no writes can happen. Um, this, there's a few ways that it can happen, but they all boil down to the same root cause, which is timeout expiry. Um, the, there's a heartbeat timeout and an election timeout. The heartbeat is basically all the nodes need to talk to each other, and if they haven't heard from the leader in a certain amount of time, then they're like, hey, I don't, know, I don't have a leader anymore, we better call an election. Um, and there's also an election timeout where if you call an election and there's no uh, election result after a certain amount of time, then you'll call another election. Um, uh, importantly here, uh, writing to the database is a blocking operation and can't happen without the leader lock, so if there's no leader, there's no writing and you know, all of your latency is very, very high. Um, the causes that we found were basically anything that adds enough latency to your writes can cause this. Disk speed, if you have slow disks, because etcd stores everything in, data in memory and saves things out to disk periodically, if that saving process out to disk periodically takes too long, it is also a blocking operation and it can make, if it takes longer than your uh, heartbeat timeout, then your node will not respond and, your, uh, and you will be in an election. And if that happens on all the nodes all the time, then you are, have an election storm. Uh, and the same thing can happen with network latency. Um, 
bit harder to have it happen with network latency if you're running in one of the big clouds, but it can happen. Uh, so, what to do about it? Firstly, I know this sounds, this is the thing that everybody says, and you're always like, oh, don't be that guy who just says read the docs, but in this case, uh, the tuning.md documentation inside the etcd repo is a complete goldmine for all of these things. It has exactly what each setting does, exactly how it works, and some tips on how you should tune it as well. You know, if you, it has like, if you're doing this, you should increase this value. If you're doing this, decrease this value, and so on. Um, so yeah, read that, and then tune your timeouts to make sure that it meets the sort of requirements and the performance char characteristics of your load. Um, watch the disk metrics, particularly how long it's taking to F-sync when you're actually doing the flush out to disk. Uh, and lastly, watch the leader elections total metric. If that is going up a lot, then you have this problem, but it hasn't been visible to you yet. Um, so you, you can have this problem and it can just impact latency enough to, to be causing some elections, but you may not notice it if there's not a lot of load in your cluster. So the other problem was filling the database. It is surprisingly easy to do. 2.1 gigabytes feels like a lot of data, but you know, it's pretty easy for a runaway queue process to generate that much data. Um, so the, one of the things that we did was um, the, you know, by default, etcd will keep all revisions of all transactions on all keys. Right? So there's a whole lot of dimensions there. It is very easy to have the, the database fill up if you let it in this way. Um, but by default, uh, Kubernetes will compact for you. That does require root privileges. So what the first time we had this problem was that we were like, ah, oh, having the API server have to have root privileges across the network is not ideal. Let's have a you know slightly less privileged role so that the so so we can control access to it and only have root privileges from the box. Great, no problems. Let's do that. We we'll do that, and then you know, sort of 24 to 48 hours later, we had a bad day because the database filled up, uh, and that's because. Only a user named root, or this was at the time, only a user named root has the permissions to perform the compaction operation. Um, you can try it, and it will just not do anything. Um, and so, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so if the database ever gets, if it actually gets to maximum size, uh, an alarm gets tripped, the database flips into read-only mode, and you will flip into sad mode. Um, the, uh, you know, and, but you can't, it actually requires human intervention to unflip that. Even if you manage to do things, there's a, there's a command you have to run to say, no, it's definitely okay to write stuff back to the database now. Um, but like I said, we managed it by getting the compaction sentence wrong, and also we had a couple of runaway things. One time, you know, this one time uh, at work, we ended up with 80,000 namespaces in our cluster. Um, ask me about that another time. It's a slightly long story. Um, so fixing the size exceeded errors is actually surprisingly tricky because your database is screwed. It is in a position where it can't make any writes. That includes writes that it would need to do to reduce the size of the database. Um, lucky you. Uh, so what you've got to do is stop all the load on each machine, compact and defragment the database. This is a manual operation that someone's going to have to go on and type the right commands for. Um, once you've done that, you need to allow the API servers to talk to the database, but you need to stop anyone else talking to the API servers so that the reconciliation loop can catch up. <clears throat> Uh, so basically, what we would do is block access to the API servers at the load balancer level, and then let them do their thing. Everything catches up. Over, after a while, the size comes down pretty dramatically. Um, the important thing here, though, is that an etcd outage is a control plane outage only. So while you were doing this, yes, it is a, you are having a bad day. Nothing is great for you. But all the people running workload on your cluster, they probably won't notice unless they are trying to do really dynamic things with the API. If they're just running services that are sitting there processing web requests, they probably won't even notice. Pardon me. <coughs> um, so, uh, it is, uh, so yeah, it was not a workload outage. Uh, you know, failing over to a, another cluster is a good idea if you can. Um, you know, hopefully you have failover. If you don't, good luck to you. Um, but, and again, in the, uh, in etcd repo, there's a maintenance.md that has really great examples of how, to, of how it can help you fix this. Um, the run book that one of the guys ended up writing uh, was literally, you know, sort of take, took big cues from this thing. So, uh, how you cannot be a uh, you know, cowboy man here. Uh, let's uh, think about all the things you can do to try and avoid having a sad day. Um, <clears throat> so, avoid adding and removing nodes for upgrades if you can. It's super easy to accidentally lose quorum. When you lose quorum, there are no longer any guarantees that the data that's in your cluster is correct. Um, most of the time, maybe you might be okay, but you don't really know for sure. 
Um, and so when you're upgrading, <coughs> the normal process is you add a node on the new version, then you remove a node of the old version. When you add a node of the new version, you change the quorum to be two nodes. And so when you remove the node of the old version, until you have finished removing that node, you are at already at n minus one. So if you lose another node while you are while the other the first the node you are removing is down, and you lose another node, you have lost quorum and your etcd data is gone. <coughs> so what the the important things here were that an etcd node's identity comes from three things: the node name, the DNS name that it refers to itself and the cluster members refer to it by, the IP address, and the data that it has in its data directory. If you have all th three of those things, as far as etcd is concerned, that is the same machine, even if it's not actually the same machine. So um, you can swap, so what you can do is shut down a machine, in our case we would throw away the entire OS partition, um, and then start up a new machine with the same name, the same IP address, a different OS and different uh, etcd version, but the same data, data directory. Because those three things were the same, as far as etcd was concerned, this is the same member, it just happens to be running a new version now, everything's, everything's sweet. And the other thing that is really nice about etcd is that once you hit uh, all, th all the nodes in your cluster running the new version, then the cluster will self-upgrade. Uh, it, it, will, it runs at the lowest possible version amongst all of the members. So it's only once you have all the members upgraded to the new version that the, the functionality of the cluster will actually be upgraded. So if you can't, if you must add or, add or remove, add and remove nodes, really, really you need to understand exactly how the quorum works and the failure cases that could happen and have pretty good processes for how you make sure you do this quickly and reliably uh, and checks along the way, all that sort of stuff. So for watching the database, there's some metrics you should watch. Here's the exact names in case you want to take a photo. Um, the, the, each one of these is pretty important. The first one is the, the log uh, F-sync duration, the second one is how long it actually takes to commit the full flush to disk, the third one is how many leader changes have been seen by, the, by this node. That one is, um, yeah, that's the sort of the canary metric that says, hey, something might be wrong. Um, and the last one is the, if you monitor nothing else from your etcd, this is the thing you've got to monitor. This is the size in bytes of the database. If that number hits 2.1 gigabytes, your database flips into read-only, and again, you flip into SAD. Um, Maintenance and tuning are your friends. You know, read those things, love them. They are, re they are actually surprisingly good documentation for something that sits in an MD inside a GitHub repo. Um, and then the usual, the usual sort of operational suspect stuff. Uh, write a recovery on book and try it out. Uh, and you know, make sure you try it out. Um, don't just write the recovery on book once. Have someone, you know, and this is where war games can help. It's actually really fun to, uh, you know, break someone else's etcd cluster and then be like, ha, 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 see if you can figure out what I did. Um, you know, maybe you sat in there and added like 40,000 services and now there's things out of space. And, you know, and then they're like, ha, now you try and fix it. Um, and then they, have, they can take the runbook and try and actually see if it works. Um, that is much better than trying to see if it works for the first time at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, that actually happened to me. Um, so yeah, uh, I have actually talked faster than I anticipated. Um, so yeah, my ATD management secrets are look after your upgrades and watch your database size and speed. Thanks very much. <laughs>